Yeah, thank you very much, dear Chairman, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, ECMO in shock and what to do after the ECLS shock trial, though. If we summarize our knowledge about RCTs in cardiogenic shock, we can state that early revascularization of the infarct related artery with PCI improves mortality. So, however, and this has been stated by the speakers before, we have seen uh, that the mortality in shock has reached 40 to 50 percent. We, we are not able to get better over the last 10 to 20 years. And this is due to the fact that there were no advancement with respect to uh, use of mechanical support devices. The only randomized trial was an ERBB shock trial, which was neutral. And at least we in our uh, CAS lab, we do not do any intraartic balloon pumping anymore. However, this was associated with an increase in the use of VO ECMO despite uh, randomized clinical trials. So we, we try to help the patient without any evidence from randomized clinical trials. And the problems are listed here with uh, mechanical support devices. So we are not sure about the optimal support. Do we need touch just two liters or even more? Uh, we do not know about optimal timing, very early, but might be too early, late might be too late. So we have any idea about optimal timing. And then, and this is most important, we must get better with respect to prevention of device complication because we are very invasive. We will have device malfunctions, limp ischemia, hemolysis, bleeding, and this contributes to the outcome of the patient enormously. So <clears throat> the first uh, a randomized trial with ECMO in shock was the ECMO CS trial from the Czech Republic. And here they took patients uh, with uh, cardiogenic shock or deteriorating uh, cardiogenic shock and they randomized the patient to immediate ECMO versus early conservative, but the possibility to implant downstream ECMO. And the primary composite endpoint was somewhat vague death, resuscitation, implementation of another mechanical support device. So they randomized 122 patients, 61 to ECMO, 61 to conservative. And uh, this was not only an acute MI trial, so about 60% had an acute myocardial infarction, another were decompensated chronic heart failures or mechanical complication of MI. And this is the result no difference with respect to this composite endpoint between ECMO and initial conservative treatment. And if you look on the hardest endpoint, mortality, again, 50% mortality, what we have seen before, versus 47% in the conservative trial. So this was the reason why we thought we need a larger trial uh, with uh, mortality alone as the endpoint, and this is the ECLS shock trial. And uh, we had some secondary endpoints, time to hemodynamic stabilization and complication of uh, the device. And we saw that uh, the event rate in our um, cohort would be 49% in the control chrome. And we saw that we were able to uh, reduce mortality to 35% in the ECMO group, and therefore we needed 420 patients. And we were able to randomize these 420 patients in 45, uh, 45 study sites in Germany and in Slovenia. And we lost three patients because they denied informed consent uh, after they were fully recovered. Um, these were the treatment uh, specificity. So most of the patients were treated with PCI. Just one patient with, was treated with cabbage. Uh, the, device was implanted in 50% before or during revascularization and another 50% after revascularization. Almost all patients received peripheral anticrat perfusion sheets to, in the order to uh, reduce peripheral vascular complications. Um, active venting, as uh, 
Peter has already mentioned, was done in only 6%. This might be a, uh, some point of criticism against the trial. And other mechanical support devices was used in 50% in the control group. So this is a primary endpoint. In the control group, 30-day mortality, 49 as predicted, and 47.8%. So no difference between control and the early routine use of ECMO in this trial. So with respect to safety, there was some increase in stroke with the ECLS, a significant increase in moderate and severe bleeding, and a significant increase in peripheral ischemic vascular complication requiring either surgical or interventional therapy. So what we did in parallel, we uh, searched for all the randomized trials using VA ECMO in cardiogenic shock. These were four, and we did the um, individual patient data meta-analysis with over 600 patients. And as you can see here, uh, the results were the same. So no benefit with respect to 30-day all-cause mortality in this meta-analysis the curves uh, just overlap. Um, then we looked for subgroups and we didn't find any subgroup who has a hint for a beneficial effect of VA ECMO, either younger versus elderly, female versus male, higher lactate versus lower lactate, cardiac arrest before randomization versus no cardiac arrest, interior MI versus other locations or unsuccessful PCI or successful PCI. No difference with respect to 30-day mortality with the ECMO. And these uh, two uh, trials or the meta-analysis were uh, uh, published simultaneously and you can look there in the New England Journal in the Lancet for more details. So what's about unloading? It seems that in some patients unloading is necessary and it seems that there is no difference with respect to the effect of unloading between intraortic balloon pump versus impeller, at least in this unrandomized uh, comparison. Uh, and uh, Peter has already mentioned the ECMELA experience. Again, not randomized observational data suggesting a positive effect of unloading in patients under VA ECMO. So that's the reason why we are waiting for the results of the randomized trials, and we have two already ongoing is the reverse trial in the US. However, it started in 2018, and the uh, randomization and uh, inclusion of patients is expected in 2025. So seven years for 100 patients. I'm not sure about the validity of this trial. Uh, I think the unload ECMO trial performed by Peter Center uh, will give a better insight in the value of um, unloading with impeller in this uh, patient population. So what's the problem of this mechanical support devices? Clearly we have a uh, an advantage with respect to organ perfusion, an advantage with respect to hemodynamics. Um, with the VA ECMO, we can improve oxygenation. This is not the case with Impella. Uh, this might be the case with uh, VA ECMO's intraortic balloon pump or Impella. We have a plus with respect to coronary perfusion and clearly with uh, unloading if we use the Impella. However, Cardiogenic shock is not only hemodynamics. Cardiogenic shock is due to inflammation. If a patient has a bleeding complication, then in this very unstable situation, patient might die because of this complication and vascular complication contribute to the overall outcome as well. And the second point is patient selection. And I think this is key. And sorry, I have to go back. So we will have about 50% of patients who will survive anyway without any mechanical support device. And then we will have another 20 to 30% of patients who will die no matter what we do. And that leaves us with about 20% of patients who might have a possible benefit of a mechanical support device. And it's extremely difficult 
to sort out this 20%. Because if we do um, a mechanical support device in a patient who does not need it, then we will have a uh, complication, and uh, I've shown you that complication contributes to the overall mortality. So far, what we can say that an unselected routine use of ECMO in patients with cardiogenic shock is not helpful, and we have to do more research to figure out which patient population would have benefit. Thank you very much.